Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am James Strode, publisher of the International Comparative Legal Guide to Digital Health for 2022. It's my privilege today to introduce you uh, Roger Kwan, who is the contributing editor of the ICLG Digital Health publication uh, and also the US head of the digital health practice at Norton Rose Fulbright. Alongside him, we have David Wallace, who is group leader of the healthcare technology team at Johnson & Johnson. So Roger, we're firmly into 2022 now, but just for one moment, I would like to backtrack uh, to, I suppose, the start of the pandemic um, and the past two years of the pandemic. Just to quickly hear a little bit more about what trends you saw develop um, through this whole problem. And I suppose the shift in expectation uh, that we've had of the digital health industry because of it. Well, James, the pandemic really precipitated a seismic shift in the healthcare industry that really began prior to the pandemic. Um, you know, for example, what you're seeing right now is that there is a shift from a provider centric model of delivering healthcare to more of a patient centric model. And um, so really the takeaway from that is that telehealth and virtual health is here to stay. Um, prior, I mean, just if you go look into st st statistics um, prior to the pandemic, telehealth was really usage was very negligible. Um, and if you look at a, a recent study that was published by um, McKinsey, um, government reports have said that really the the use of telehealth has increased um, up to almost seventy percent of all patient interactions with their providers uh, during the pandemic was done through a telehealth or virtual health type of platform. Um, what you also seen is really an increase in public awareness uh, and in terms of managing their own personal health. And you're seeing these adoption. I mean, you don't have to look any further than to see folks buying these, these oximeters to measure their, uh, their oxygen levels uh, and all these various types of uh, COVID diagnostic test kits are used at home right now. Um, there's mass adoption of these, of all of these types of products and, and that really was, was not seen, at least in, any, in the same level of, uh, uh, in the same mass adoption levels prior to the pandemic. Yeah, fan fantastic. Thank you, uh, Roger. And, and to David, mo moving forwards, um, I, I suppose uh, as you work at the forefront um, of the digital health industry, I'd be keen to hear from you um, and what you think are the ripest areas of growth, expansion, and innovation uh, for 2022 within the industry? Yeah, I think what we're seeing is a lot of sort of more of the same. Uh, the broadening use of artificial intelligence, including machine learning and deep learning, is here today. And I think we've come past the point where that's a novelty, but more moving out of the sandbox and development toward more commercial applications. So I think that that's a that's a big one. Roger touched on something I think also it's very important, and that's the so the notion of connected, sort of personalized monitoring of one's own health data. So we saw that a bit with post oximeters, but we're seeing that more with things like the Oura Ring, um, Apple Watches, various other technologies. And I think what you're seeing there is you're getting the common person that's really more involved and invested in all of their omics to better understand how they're doing at the moment and also be able to provide that information to their you know to their doctors or their care providers fantastic and uh, roger david's just mentioned there about the common person being involved more in, in their day-to-day uh, -day health this year within the publication we've seen a lot of commentary uh, around non-traditional healthcare players starting to enter the market where you have the consumers interested in what's going on and you have these, I suppose, traditional tech firms wanting to get into the healthcare space. I'd be keen to hear from you just a little bit more about what advice or top tips you would give these types of companies thinking about entering the digital health market. Yeah, that's certainly the case, James. I mean, really, anybody. what we're seeing right now is anybody who has any large quantities of data around individuals' behaviors, 
uh, uh, and uses of, of the internet, et cetera, are really beginning to go ahead and see the use of this data uh, being applicable in the healthcare space. Um, I think the really primary piece of advice I have for companies that those type of companies are entering into space is this is a very highly regulated space. And they need to understand that a lot of, they need to prepare for this up front rather than trying to go ahead and mitigate uh, some of those issues later on down the road. For example, this, these spaces have uh, these in the healthcare space, you're regul regulated by FDA regulations, you're regulated by a lot of issues related to reimbursement, as well as data privacy, uh, data privacy laws that, that including such as things such as HIPAA and, uh, and informed consent. All these issues have to be taken into account up front. And uh, I think that's something that maybe is not as familiar with the with the tech industry in general, that uh, I think there is this model that's been developed over the years where um, if any any product or service issues come up, you can go ahead and patch it somewhere down the road. Well, you can't patch these issues somewhere down the road. You've got to handle them all up front and plan for it accordingly. Fantastic. D David, um just picking up on that point around, around data, um, and again, within our publication this year, we've seen a lot of discussion um, around data, data science, machine learning, something you've already mentioned. Um, I suppose I'd be interested to find out what can data science do to push innovation, and is there really enough real-world data uh, and collaboration between companies at the moment to give patients the outcomes they need uh, and, and the industry ultimately wants. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of promise in the benefits and uses of data science, including machine learning and deep learning. Uh, we've been able to, and I think we've the, the industry has seen, uh, drug discovery is a, is a big, big opportunity there. There's just a tremendous amount of data, and, and that data varies in quality and varies in how it's skewed in terms of different categories of people that um, the data represents and different features of that data. So being able to tackle some of the most difficult diseases that we're trying to conquer, such as all the various types of cancer using uh, machine learning and deep learning um, is, is a big advantage. And I think that's proven so. Uh, getting to the, your last question, you know, how, where's this collaboration going to come from? And we've seen that as well. I think the companies that are interested and motivated to figure out how to manage their own privacy concerns, their own confidentiality concerns, their own intellectual property concerns, and then realize that these are very difficult problems to solve with minimal data sets. So being able to combine data sets in a way that still preserves privacy and competitive advantage, and we've seen that in some sorts of consortiums. Um, that have happened over in Europe, like Project Melody is one that um, I'm familiar with, where that was a federated learning model. And it was also underpinned with a blockchain, uh, you know, sort of application that preserved that privacy. So those things I think are showing that we're moving from just gathering data, you know, going through science experiments, to actually gathering data, showing real commercial application and then dealing with the trust and privacy and other you know, intellectual property issues that are going to be needed to be dealt with if we're going to have these different company partnerships to tackle these problems. Right. You know, so, David, I, I got a question related to that. I mean, you know, we all are beginning to recognize really the, value, the overall value of data um, in general, right? And not just in the healthcare industry, but, but actually a lot of industries, you know, throughout, throughout the world. Now, the um, so how do you encourage sharing of this data because we all realize that uh, really the, the power in AI machine learning in particular lies in really the underlying data that's being fed to it. So large quantities of high quality data is important that to, to run to really drive these solutions that tackle a lot of the I guess a lot of these uh, these healthcare challenges we're facing right now. Yeah I, I think you're absolutely right and, and it's that's a really difficult thing for a lot of companies to do. I mean, we're partnering with our competitors and traditionally that would be something that we don't do. I think what's unique about this space, many companies realize that there's power in sharing data just because not data sets are created equal and depending upon the problems that you want to solve, you're going to need different types of quality data, which is what you get on. 
So many of the companies are looking at where can I supplement a data set that I have that maybe can't necessarily help me answer these really critical questions. Because remind you, it starts with the question, what problem do you want to solve? And you look at the data and say, do I have the data to help me solve that problem? And then is that data structured in a way that can be processed through my ML pipeline? Those are really challenging. Each of those steps are really challenging to do. So if you sort of step back from this and figure out, you know, is there more value in sharing the data with potential competitors to move the science forward to benefit patients, doctors, nurses, and other healthcare providers? Is, is that bigger mission something that's compelling enough to allow us to sort of join forces? And I think you're seeing that. Um, you're seeing that more and more now because I think we're moving from these sort of proprietary data sets to try to solve bigger problems that we realize we do need to partner. And um, just picking up on that notion of collaboration there, I suppose it leads me nicely um, to, to ask Roger a little bit more about uh, this year's uh, edition. As contributing editor, um, I'd be pleased to, to hear from you uh, what's new this year and, and what's changed ever so slightly because ultimately this is a resource that wants to guide the industry from a legal perspective um, across the world in, in what we do so roger I'll, I'll let you explain to the folks this year of uh, what, what's new and, and, and what to look out for thanks james yeah that's a great question i mean we this year what we've tried to do is really put a lot more emphasis on really defining the the market size by jurisdiction for digital health in general just to give everyone a sense of, a, of how much has grown over the, over the, just over the last year. Um, what we also have tried to put a lot of emphasis on is these data issues. A lot of the articles, the expert articles that we put in this year is really dealing with the challenges and, and of, uh, of uh, sharing and using data in the healthcare space, as well as, as you know, really the opportunities that kind of poses for a lot of uh, industry players. So uh, we, we have put in several expert articles uh, that around around that those points and, and trying to get different perspectives on that. Uh, we've also tried to look in deeper into um, the regulatory issues and legal issues around, again, uh, sharing the data as, as used in the AI machine learning space. Um, these are very pertinent topics and things that I think we just touched on earlier even uh, today. Um, data is everything in a lot of ways in healthcare at this point in terms of the future wise. Um, and we are definitely uh, seeing coming across a lot of these uh, very complex legal issues and, and hopefully this guide will get, will give uh, you know at least some sort of ro roadmap for folks who are trying to enter this industry this uh, particular space uh, as to how to navigate those issues yeah fan, fan, fantastic Roger and and uh, to, to add to that as well um, we, we've got some new jurisdictions covered this year where we've seen healthcare uh, and, and the digital healthcare space really take off as as well and um, I suppose to, to you, David, sitting from your in-house counsel position, um, I'd be keen to hear why you think uh, that the, the resource, the publication, is a good one for you and colleagues. Uh, and, and really, you know, explain just ever so quickly who should be picking this up and, and, and why, really. It's a practical guy. A lot of what we deal with in-house, and I would imagine at the firm level as well, as unpacking terms like digital health, AI, machine learning, data analytics, data science, into meaningful counsel to solve business issues. And that's what the guide really is. It's, it's organized in a way that you can pick it up, survey what the issues are, because you may not know all of them, and then dig deep and not just understand the legal framework, but understand in practice, how do you operationalize um, these issues and how do you become that sort of trusted advisor to your, your business clients? Um, and it's the other, I think the other aspect of it, it's global. I mean, we're in a global space. Data doesn't really know boundaries. And the fact that this guy brings together multiple viewpoints from different jurisdictions, I think is key if you're really gonna practice well in this space. Thanks. Thanks, David. And um, listen, I, I appreciate you guys coming along today um, to chat. I, I know you, you're both in San Francisco and I'm, I'm here in London. 
Uh, and uh, I hope you guys at home who, who pick up this video uh, have, have enjoyed it. Uh, all I'll say uh, to close again is, is thank you to David and, and Roger um, for, for their efforts within the publication this year uh, and coming along today. Um, I hope you guys can pick it up uh, online as a resource, in hard copy as a resource, uh, and use it to the fullest extent. As David says, it's a global guide, and this is an industry that has no uh, boundaries to it. So thanks again to you both. Uh, appreciate your efforts, uh, and we'll see you soon. Thank you, James. Thanks, James.